folks, this is Andy, your host with the Poor Pearls Almanac, where knowledge is for everyone and the rules don't matter. Welcome back. Well, that's more for us than you, right? It's been a while, right, Elliot? What year is it? Or should I do it like Rob Willis? I don't know what that means. You never seen Jumanji? I don't know who people are. You know who Robin Williams is. Oh, Robin Williams. Yes, I know who Robin Williams is. What year is it? Sure, let's go to the first one. I got nothing. <laughs> All right. You do it. So hopefully you enjoyed that new intro music. It's, as the kids say, a bop. It's like you've never spoken to a child before in your life. I mean, the only ones I do are below six. So yes, that, that would be accurate. This is all making sense then, I guess. Yeah. So welcome to season two. While you enjoyed the last 20-ish episodes that were just primarily interviews, we've actually been busy in the background working to make this season even better. And I know you don't think that's possible. We got new gear, new intro music, and all new content. And what's all that content about? Wow. What, did, what is that continent about, Elliot? Continent? Wait, what? What content are we covering? Oh. Uh, I'm not going to tell them. Nope. They got to listen and find out. Got to make them work for it. So at this point in the show, when we think way back to those early episodes on basic ag and ecology, we had talked primarily about things like fruit trees and orchard management to an extent. We talked about grazing and trying to manage your landscape and figuring out what that should look like. Generally thinking about natural systems and how we can play off of those natural ecologies to figure out better ways to do things, whether that's using perennials, which have stronger root structures, or, um, you know, whatever it might be. In that sense, that's how we're going to continue thinking about this stuff. And now we're going to dig in a little bit deeper about utilizing multiple layers of that. So it sounds like you're getting ready to get on a roll. And hop into this episode. So why don't you just drop some knowledge on me? Drop in knowledge. So while some of this was a big part of traditional farming centuries ago, it was all assumed to be such common knowledge that it wasn't really written down. And there is some, but not like a ton. And most of it's not in English. So we we went out and did a mini series on traditional agricultural practices. So if you guys want to go check that out, that was called the Pro Models. And for us to do that research, we had to actually dig through a bunch of papers uh, on various academic sites. And that was really the only place you could find it. If you Googled that information, it didn't exist. So that speaks to how buried this information really has become. The practice that we're going to be talking about today is called silvopasture, which is a combination of trees, forage plants, and livestock in what you could consider an integrated, intensively managed system. And that sounds scary, but it's really not, because what we're really talking about is a stacked system of outputs that reinforces our food resiliency. I looked up silvopasture on the Google machine, and silva is the Latin base root word for forest, and pasture, I didn't really look that up because I I feel like I had done enough research and Andy was going to do the rest. Wow. Um, (laughs) Wow. Yeah. Honestly, what was I going to read that you didn't already know? I mean, I don't know what pasture means, like in terms of the Latin it. So you could have had me. Really? You could have been number one. I thought you would have started at step one. My bad. You just <laughs> skipped right to the middle. <laughs> so there are two general areas of silvo pasture that I want to focus on primarily, at least in this episode, that aren't covered in previous sections of this podcast. And that's using fruit and nut trees to feed your animals and maybe even yourself and the use of leaves as a replacement or a supplement for grass feed. And again, you know. Maybe yourself. Seriously? Yeah, man. You want me to eat like leaves? Yeah. You're like a gazelle. Come on. So actually, seriously, though, people are doing research on creating edible mulberry leaves. So mulberries, if you're not familiar with them, are primarily a fruit producing tree. And while they do have incredibly uh, delicious fruit, similar to like blackberries, the leaves are super high in nitrogen which translates to protein. So they're really great for livestock. But some folks have found that there's actually some select cultivars that have leaves that are actually really, I wouldn't say enjoyable, but close to enjoyable. So there's a lot of research work uh, going towards breeding those selectively to make them more edible. So that means they're bitter and people don't probably don't like to eat them. And it probably means you can't smoke them like like the good herbs, you know? I mean, no, but they're super high in protein. 
You're going to get swole. Getting swole? I'm yeah. all I'm all about it. <laughs> Bring me those bitter greens. Are yeah, they yeah. are they like dark and leafy or yeah. are they What is it? It, it they're tree leaves. They're like legitimately like 3 inch by 3 inch tree leaves. All right. So. I guess I'll, you know, can't hurt to eat more vegetables, right? Yeah, something like that. And worst case scenario, you don't like them, you don't eat them. Give them to your livestock. So this first part that we just discussed, utilizing the fruits and nuts in particular, is becoming fairly common because of the foodie movement. So things like chestnut finished pigs, apple finished pigs, and well, a lot of folks just finishing pigs on specific fruits and nuts. So it's all about that bacon. About that bacon. About that bacon. Also known in small groups as meat candy, huh? And by small groups, I mean I had a drunk friend one night to refer to it as meat candy, bacon. And I did, had never heard it before in my life, but I immediately knew what he was talking about. It was just one of those things. And I thought it was really funny. So when I say it and somebody knows what I'm talking about, it's, it's funny. It's like common ground. I guess. How does bacon fit into a complex system? Well, the answer is simple. Just like we had talked about in one of the previous episodes, animals are very much like piggy banks, let's call them. And the idea is that you can feed them things that you can eat or you just don't want to eat or whatever, and you store it in the animals for a later time. So, you know, the focus shouldn't be necessarily to just clean up the mess of rotten apples and bring them over to your pigs or bring the pigs in one time a year but to really have them to be part of your rotational grazing system so that the animals aren't having to go out of their way or you're not going out of your way to collect, harvest, whatever, whatever it is that you want them to eat. So you don't want to be saying, oh, it's mulberry season. I need to go you know, try to clean up this giant pile of messy mulberries, bring it over to the pigs because they grazed that, that paddock two weeks ago and it's not ready to be regrazed. So the idea is that you want to build that into your system and to start thinking about, all right, this is my grazing pattern. If this is my grazing pattern, then where are my animals going to be when that fruit is getting ready to drop or maybe dropped a week ago? So it depends on what you're really thinking about. Are you harvesting apples because you only want to collect maybe 100 pounds, but you get maybe 400 pounds? So you say, all right, I want to get my 100 pounds. I need animals to come in afterwards and clean up the mess. So that that's a little bit of how you want to start thinking about it. Yeah, so animals can eat a whole lot of food. Like you just referred to food in pounds, sort of like the beginning of like Oregon Trail. I've never worked on a farm, so I have no idea how you or Old McDonald runs their shit or feeds their pigs. But I'm guessing th- there's got to be a lot of food like happening there. And so with silvopasture, we're talking about like this isn't just one or two trees and like some grass. This is like a lot of different kinds of trees or is it like are you talking about like an orchard where it's just one kind of tree dropping you know thousands of pounds of apples or whatever it is berries fruit nuts yeah so your paddock is you know it depends on really how big your site is paddocks can be as small as like 20 by 20 square feet if you're running just a couple of smaller animals so if you're running if you were theoretically just using uh you know a pair of dwarf goats your paddock might only be 20 by 20 if you're moving them every day. Mm. So you might only have one or two trees in each paddock, theoretically. But if you think about like a full-size apple tree, if you're dropping 400 pounds of fruit from that one tree and you're harvesting 100 pounds of it yourself, you've just dropped 300 pounds of food. That's a lot of food. So that's like how you want to start thinking about it. Now when we're talking about even like a suburban lot that might be an acre or two, you could be looking at four or five different fruit and nut trees in that one particular paddock. So you could be adding up to like a thousand pounds of forage for your livestock in each paddock. That That's like a lot of food in production. So that's what you really want to start thinking about is like, how can this create more opportunity for you? And your livestock. And your livestock. So that's kind of the basics of utilizing fruits and nuts. Like that's as as simple as it really is. So when we talked about like that idea of the piggy bank, the, the general idea isn't just that we want to capture that energy within our animals, but also the benefits of the civil pastures layers. So here in New England, while it traditionally doesn't get above 90, 95 degrees, it does. And it's going to do it even more with climate change. So by having these trees, 
the trees might get hit by that 90, 95 degrees. And then the top canopy, it's usually a couple degrees cooler when you get off the ground. So depending on where they are exactly, they might be able to absorb some of the energy and photosynthesize, while the grass, if there was no trees, wouldn't be able to. Further, you've got grass below your tree line. So, you know, if you've ever been in the shade of a tree, it's usually 15, 20 degrees cooler on a really hot day. So you're able to have, still continue to photosynthesize underneath those tree layers. So you're extending your season by making things more efficient. So you're not only getting the benefits of having the trees, you're also in many cases, depending on the time of year and your personal climate, actually getting a benefit for the grass itself. So like grasses can be a C3 or a C4 grass. And if you remember from that episode we had done on pastures, those C3 grasses do better at cooler temperatures. The C4 do better at higher temperatures. But even the C4 grasses do get a cutoff point where they no longer can photosynthesize. So the benefit of this savanna atmosphere is that we can take advantage of those differences while also getting the benefit of those tree layers, which now create multiple layers of photosynthesis. Okay, so this is setting up that layer of complexity that we talk about in complex systems where we are adding um, this specific type of tree into this landscape to help out the grass. And also, uh, this is going to bring, you know, food and keep all the more energy within this system rather than having something that's less efficient. Yeah, absolutely. So you're getting the benefits of these different specialties that each plant has to offer, which creates ultimately more resilience across the board. We can use this in a multiple uh, multitude of different ways. We traditionally think about grass as being for hay, which of course it can. But additionally, we haven't really covered the other half. So we talked about the fruits and nuts, but also utilizing the tree hay or the tree fodder, which people might not usually think of as a traditional food for livestock. So whatever term you happen to use, I've heard tree hay, tree litter, tree fodder, whatever one you use, these all have been traditional practices for managing uh, livestock since as long as people have had domesticated livestock. So there's a number of different reasons why it's been used and the history and the practice itself has been, I I don't want to say lost, but it's been um, kind of marginalized and it was considered so common that it wasn't really written down, at least in depth in English. Did we talk about this when we did the episode on uh, Norway? We did. So that was one of the main practices that they had done is they would have these fields with these trees that they would pollard which is cut at like about four or five feet. They would harvest the hay early spring before the trees had fully filled out. And and they made the, the bundles, sun. right? Yeah. They would bundle them up. Yeah. And then they stored them pretty much the same way they did hay. It was up high and dry, right? Yeah. There was a couple different methods for storing the tree hay. And we're actually going to cover that in another episode. So if you guys are interested in that, brace yourself. We're going to be covering it in the future. But I do want to cover it a little bit here, just so you guys kind of have the process kind of in the back of your head. So the general idea is that in this process of harvesting these leaves for feeding animals, um, you're able to manage how much sunlight gets to the ground, when it gets to the ground, while also benefiting yourself in terms of what you're harvesting from the site, whether that's just the leaves for your animals, the twigs which the animals will also often eat, or if you're also trying to harvest things like timber or firewood or sticks for your tomato plants or whatever it might be. There's a bunch of different things we can pull from this. So all of this generally falls under this really vague, broad term of agroforestry, which is exactly what it sounds like, managing a forest for production. And while that can mean a bunch of different things, it's important to keep in mind our episodes that we had done on forest ecology and succession as we try to envision the agroforestry system that best fits our needs and our site's needs. Okay, so forest succession, we've talked about that before. That's like from growing from fields, grass fields, and brushland to forests with taller trees as complexity goes through over, what, hundreds of years, thousands of years? Are All of this depends on, you know, the environment and the weather and other things like that. So, when we say for a succession in our lifetime, what does that mean like to people? So that really depends on where you live and the biome that you exist within. 
So those plants will really direct what that exactly looks like. But we really have to start thinking about what that process looks like. So to recap on the forest succession episodes, we had talked about the process of, say, you've got this old pasture land or someplace where a fire had ripped through, whatever it might be. So you've got those first seeds coming in, the weeds that kind of fall from wherever they're coming from and dropping into the field and interspersing with the grasses. And slowly you start to see the local vines start coming in and dominating the site. Woodier plants, your milkweeds and things like that start to show up. Perennials begin to take over and slowly you get these vines and bushes. And as that process continues, trees will start popping up, those really fast growing, short living trees. And it's really in this in this ecology where humans started to exist. And this is the savanna biome, which is arguably the most productive land ecosystem on Earth. Additionally, the savanna is the second richest biome on Earth behind the tropical and subtropical moist broadleaf forests. But on a pound for pound basis, more mammals can live in a savanna than anywhere else on land. So like I asked you a simple question about what this means for people. And you brought it back to ancient times in Mesopotamia. That's what I do. <laughs> where the savanna grassland is where our shared ancestors stood up for the first time and used fire to cook food. Yeah, well, there's a reason for that. So if you think about our livestock, they're all domesticated savanna species. So it's not a coincidence that the animals that we still eat today are primarily from the same ecology. It's because that's where we lived. That's where we identified things that we liked and could capture and eventually try to domesticate. So it's not a surprise that that's what we eat today continuously. Uh, the savannas are also such richly abundant systems that they even supported the large megafauna that we, had, you know, wiped off the face of the earth, supposedly the mammoths. All right, that's wild. The Midwestern U.S. was once more like the savannas of Africa, more than anything we see today. Is that what you're telling me? Yeah. And there were camels and elephants and lions and tigers and bears. No oh. lions. Oh, my. Oh, my. There oh. might have been lions. I don't know. I don't think there was, lions. there was no lions. So, you can't tell me there was lions. Yeah. Detroit, so, Detroit lions in the Midwest. The, Damn it. There were lions. Okay, go ahead. It's all over. Case closed. So to bring it back, the landscape in the United States, the breadbasket, the Midwest, whatever you want to call it. Yes, it was managed by elephants primarily. They were the biggest animals. And they managed the entire savanna of the world, whether that was here or Africa or Asia, anywhere that savannas existed, they were the ones that primarily managed it. And while that seems unimportant, it shouldn't be. The reason why I think it's personally interesting is that there's actually a lot of research going on today, which is focusing on imagining what forests looked like before human intervention. And because of massive megafauna like elephants, it's thought that most of the forests looked pollard and encompassed from the incredibly large plant eaters, which would just rip plants out of the ground or strip any new growth as soon as it came up. So trees needed to evolve to be able to handle having new growth just ripped right off of them and shoot up new stuff and survive. Otherwise, they wouldn't exist. So these were trimmed down, similar to how grasses today are trimmed down by cows or sheep or whatever it might be. It was these elephants that helped create the savanna where we as a species learn to hunt and thrive. It shouldn't be surprising with this in mind when we think back to the episodes we did on indigenous agricultural systems, that practices of coppicing and pollarding were utilized to create similar landscapes, especially paired with prescribed burns, considering this situation. Yeah, and I'm just disappointed you made a reference to smoking trees before I did in this episode. Yeah, yeah. But you hear that noise? Is that a jingle? It might be. It's not Santa Claus. Or is it? Are you suffering from minor irritation, occasional water shortages, infrastructural collapse, or a general unhappiness with the state? The Poor Proles Almanac Patreon might be for you. The Poor Proles Almanac has been shown to ease anxiety and support community resilience through a voluntary, subscription-based system to support collective liberation when taken responsibly. Side effects may include seed hoarding, root cellaring, staring in awe at the beauty of nature, and outright radicalization. 
in rare cases, it may lead to the radicalization of friends and loved ones, and maybe even that guy that stands next to you at the bus stop. So talk to your local deviant to see if the Poor Proles Almanac Patreon is right for you. Well, that was interesting. What happened? I didn't hear anything. You didn't hear anything? Nope. I think I need new medication. What were we talking about? Plants. Plants, that's right. Okay. We are a podcast. Welcome back to the Poor Pearl's Almanac, I think. Maybe. Simulacra? No. Elliot's oh, shaking his head at me. Let's go on with the episode. Okay. Uh, so we're talking about elephants and landscape management. So let's kind of wrap that up. So it was the end of the last ice age when humans first began to arrive in North America. When humans arrived in the Americas, a continent-wide mass extinction began that included a majority of the megafauna. There's generally two trains of thought around what exactly happened. The most common one is that those animals had never experienced humans before and were unable to adopt to the hunting pressure that they had experienced. I'm not really sold on this, and I tend to believe that as plant species evolved, the climactic changes, and as their seed dispersal systems were changing, the food chain was simplified as selection pressure tightened, which further stressed the systems to support these massive animals, which required incredibly complex systems to sustain them. Add in new humans as an invasive species, and we were likely the final straw, but not the main piece responsible. Some new research has even started pointing out, specifically from Natalie Mueller, suggesting that sweeter fruits had become more common during this time, and this was part of why agriculture began to develop. To explain this a little bit deeper, if our nut trees and all the other things that produce high amounts of protein switch to sugars, animals like woolly mammoths that need massive amounts of protein and fat aren't able to bulk up for the cold weather and to keep their entire body mass regulated. So as sugars replaced fats and proteins, they just couldn't compete. But This whole thing's a conversation for another day, but a really important part of understanding where our food systems come from. So to circle back, as these megafauna began to go extinct, so did a whole chain of organisms, including the dependent parasites, birds, and a whole host of other animals related to that animal's existence. Birds like the oxpecker and the North American aquatic rhinoceros had lived in symbiosis with other animals feeding one another and providing one another with shelter and safety. This deep interconnected diversity is what created the deepest, most fertile soils on the entire planet, those deep fertile soils that we destroyed in the Midwestern United States. It was this temperate, humid elephant savanna of North America. That same diversity is what also provided resilience and stability to the system. If one pest or disease became a limiting factor on part of the system, other parts of that system were still healthy and whole. So you're going to sit here and tell me that the woolly elephant and what, the beaver are responsible for the amber waves of grain in the breadbasket in the U.S.? Yeah. Before all the dust bowls and stuff started happening? Yep. Thank a beaver. Kiss a beaver? Ooh. (laughs) That is not PG-13. No. All right, all right. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Ooh, I wish you could see my face. I need to take. I need to take a sip. This is fucking awful. Yeah, it's brutal. I'm just putting them through the ringer. All right. So to bring this all back together, in order to successfully create these types of systems, meaning a diverse, resilient ecosystem, you must first have a basic understanding of what the biome is where your site is being established. In addition to the particular species of a place, biomes are also defined by their particular successional pathway that occurs in that region. For example, where we're located right here in coastal New England, oak hickory forests are the last succession for our pine oak forests, and they produce significantly more food, both for humans and other animals. These systems aren't plug and play. Different species come in and go based on the specifics of each region. Just because you want specific species doesn't mean that those species even if they can handle the soil type and climate, are the best fit because of the biological relationships they have with the wildlife. Specifically, thinking about the bacteria and fungi in the soil that have evolved for tens of thousands of years with these species. Sure, most wild animals, fungi, and bacteria can likely utilize the crops you grow, but that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have the benefit of those thousands of years of coevolution. 
Like, to be clear, this doesn't mean you can't grow non-native species or even invasive species, which is a whole other conversation, but rather that you should consider those to be supplemental species for your site, not necessarily the primary ones. And like we had talked about in the planning your site episode, thinking about substituting, say, edible cherries for another cherry or something similar versus the native black cherry, you can help bridge those biological gaps. Knowing your biome and knowing the individual species that take place in the successional progression of your place will give you the highest likelihood of success. Think about it. If you plant trees, shrubs, canes, and vines and forages that would naturally occur in your region anyways, don't you think they would have a better chance of success than if you planted whatever you wanted that may or may not be able to survive with the unique conditions of your location? We haven't really covered that much in regards to planting and preparation for climate change, but it is an area we will be covering in further detail in the future, and it should be considered, but this is a good place to start. I'm still trying to keep up. So silvopasture is under this umbrella term of agroforestry, right? So it's taking an intensive land management practice like traditional farming and applying it to the knowledge of a forest full of trees with, do you have fences? Is it like... Is it, how, I'm trying to picture like how broad it is. Cause we've talked about savannas. Sure. We've talked about the Midwest. We've talked about like large swaths, like how, how large are we managing? It can and, be. And then I guess the second part of that question is how large are we managing? And then where does the nature's untouched like biome come into play? Like, is there encroachment? Does one affect the other on those boundary lines? How, how does all of that tie in so all of that ties in in a bunch of different ways so your silvo pasture site can be as small or as large as you want it has to do with the carrying capacity of the land and the amount of livestock that you have and if you're supplementing those livestock with any hay or whatever it might be feed so even here on an acre if you have a productive acre like here in new england you can manage a handful of sheep and some chickens and some ducks with no outside feed if you have a good system that's already mature. So like your house. Yeah. I mean, it's not mature, but you know, that's, that's a general idea is you only need, you only need a couple acres. Now, in terms of this relationship with the wildlife in permaculture, they would have what's called zone five, which is the untouched landscape. That's for nature, whatever that means. And I fundamentally disagree with this idea. Humans have managed landscapes since we have existed on the earth. And the idea that we shouldn't manage landscapes or that there's space that we should not touch goes against kind of what what we do as a species and how we exist. And there's obviously different amounts of what that management looks like. And that doesn't mean we go in every place and clear the trees for what we want, but it does mean that even in the swamps in indigenous areas here in New England, while those weren't managed for food production in the traditional sense of growing crops or you know, planting selective cultivars or anything like that, they were given over to the like pine trees and all those other things that in the swamplands um, were really good for wildlife. So when they would hunt various birds and rabbits and things like that, that's primarily where they lived. So it was managed, but in a different way. So it didn't necessarily mean it was completely untouched, but rather that their involvement isn't what you might traditionally think of as land management. Um, so generally speaking, when we're talking about all these things, the, the entire character of that biome is mostly influenced by the trees. So when we're talking about managing a swampland or um, here in New England where trees were managed and there was selective burning and sp- specific species were kept while others weren't, the, the trees are not only the largest and longest living members of that plant community that's on the landscape, but they are the biggest. With that said, they have the biggest amount of impact. They pull up mineral nutrients from the deep layers of the earth, and they combine those mineral nutrients with carbon dioxide that they inhale from the atmosphere. As the trees begin to drop their leaves and things like that, they ultimately begin to chemically dominate the site and to create the site to the conditions they want. If their leaves are 30% this and 20% that, and they drop to the soil and they start to break down, now you've got 30% this and 20% that in the soil, at least in the topsoil. 
So they slowly create the entire ecological conditions for what they want in order to survive. Specific families like the Juglandaceae family, which is walnuts, hickories, and pecans, release juglones that are essentially herbicides that kill many other plants that they don't want around them. There are species that survive within it, and this is a reminder of how much of a difference these trees can make on their site, where they can literally drop leaves so that only things that can exist there are what they want to exist there, which is wild. So this is why practices like Korean natural farming are really good, because we can help accelerate this process. If we go to a hickory tree out in the woods, and we collect that leaf litter in the dirt and get that fungi and bacteria, separate it by going through the processes of harvesting that IMO, the indigenous microorganisms, now you've got a jar full of the native bacteria and fungi in the soil that have evolved for 20,000 years, 30,000 years, whatever it might be, with those trees in order to help efficiently give them the resources they need to survive. So if you're working on a former you know, suburban lot, where maybe it was pine trees for a hundred years, and then they came in, cleared the site, threw down a couple inches of topsoil, nothing is native there, and then you plant your hickory tree, and you're like, it's not growing. You add this, and now you're adding back in those indigenous microorganisms that are from that area that can efficiently get the things that the tree needs out of the ground. So that's the general idea of Korean natural farming, and we're going to be covering that in a couple of weeks. To circle back, this points to the fact that these large dominant trees really set the rules for the site. And that's why it's so important to learn your biome and get to know the soil types, things like rainfall patterns and you know what kinds of trees have lived in that site throughout history, not just within the last hundred years, but within the last couple thousand. What have existed there before colonists showed up, if that's something that happened where you lived, and start to really figure out what could fit into this site given things like climate change and invasive species and all these other things. So wherever you live and whatever your biome it is, you'll have a greater success rate if you imitate what was there before. Yeah, it does bring to mind uh, a lot of parks that I go to around here. And at the beginning of the spring or early summer, they do a whole lot of maintenance and upkeep on the park and make it look really nice. But then by the end of the summer in August, when things get really hot, and humid, everything dies off and they stop taking care of the park because they know it's going to be fall soon and then the snow is going to come and everything's going to die. And nothing really has like any succession to it at all, really. It's just sort of there in the spring and the summer and looks nice. And then you got to come back and do it all over again. And it doesn't really seem to have like a natural cycle like to any of it. Yeah, there's it's a managed landscape. And the interesting thing about things like arboretums is that if you were to look at the plants that are in an arboretum, they generally don't have any natural um, relationship to one another. They're usually things that people think look pretty and can handle the climate and the soil and blah, blah, blah. But they're never usually from the same place in the world, specifically not where you happen to be. So what ends up happening is you've got all these different, essentially, microbiomes within your park. All these trees that the biology has no relation to one another. And... Unfortunately, that means you can have something like the Arnold Arboretum in Boston, which has an incredible amount of trees and bushes and things like that from across the world. But despite this, the biological community there is less resilient than like the you know 30-year-old, 40-year-old forest on the side of the highway that's all native. So that speaks to the fact that there's much more to it than just saying, I'm going to take these different trees and stick them in one spot because they're the trees I want to have. You'd be the only one that stops on the side of the highway to appreciate the trees and doesn't go to the Arboretum. I, I do both. It's fine. <laughs> but yeah, so as I mentioned before, the biome that has the widest distribution across North America is the savanna. The particular form of savanna that's most widespread in North America is the oak savanna. In oak savannas, there are a handful of plants that you're likely to see and there's some variation usually for what those plants are based on where in the country you are. But generally speaking, you'll see things like oaks, chestnuts, walnuts, and hickories, and beeches, as well as locusts. And below that canopy, you might see wild apples, hazelnuts, cherries, and plums. And beneath the tree layer, you're likely to see the raspberries, blackberries, gooseberries, and grapes. 
There are other trees that are common as well, pines and cedars and so on. But I really want to focus on the edible varieties and ones that are more or less fairly standard across the country. Because there are places where you might have widespread other trees and it's not worth going into, at least not right now. So what we're trying to do is design an agricultural system that closely mimics the savanna in terms of structure, meaning the relationship, how distant trees are from one another, as well as the layering, such as the canopy and right below the canopy and so on. Further, we want to think about the species mix. And again, with those cultivated substitutions, those related species, those select cultivars that fit into those subcategories. So if you're thinking about black cherries that are native to you, you might want to consider a cultivated cherry that's more edible, things like that. So while we do want to use native species as the predominant larger species, we can use select cultivars for our oaks, hickories, and so on. And beneath the main canopy, we can use more domesticated plants. Again, if we think about what we had just said, the largest ones set the tone. So we need to keep those native species as the primary agent on our site. So let's think about that when we start putting together what our site should look like. Have you hugged a tree lately? Have I? Yeah. Is that has what a I tree, hear? Has a tree hugged you lately? Is a tree hugging me? Is that what that sound is? Yes. Oh, no. Are you thirsty? No? Do you want to be? Try bean curd. With twice the chewiness of a sponge and half the flavor of dough. What could be better? Nothing! Take your high-protein block of cardboard and make a great meal incredibly mediocre. Say it with me now. Herd your thirst with curd! Can you smell what the rock is cooking? Because it's bean curd. Learn more about the power of bean curd at poorpoles.com. Stay thirsty, friends. All right. That was fun. Who is that person? I didn't hear anything. Cool. Well, this is fun. So let's start talking about trees with those big nut drops. Nothing? Are you kidding me? It's low hanging fruit. And I'm not <laughs> talking I'm not talking about trees, you know what I mean? So while acorns are not attractive as a consumable food, probably they can be. I know Elliot loves to eat an acorn or two. You know, I've I've thought about it and I, I know there's a step that you gotta take out some of the, the I don't know. How do you you gotta soak them or something, right? Yeah, you gotta you gotta leach the tannins. Leach the tannins, that's what it is. That's the word. Leach the tannins of those drop nuts. And then what? What do you do? How many like can you do acorn soup? What else can you make with acorns? You can make acorn flour. You can make That's the other one, flour. Acorn meal. What's the difference between flour and meal? You tell me isn't flour and meal the difference is like the coarse coarseness? Yeah. Yes. Come on, aren't you the cook? Yeah, but I would never use acorn. What would I use acorn you could meal use for? Corn meal, though. And you know what corn flour looks like. I'd have to think about it. You want to try to make some? Acorn? Flour? flour meal? Meal, meal? Meal first. Yeah, we can make acorn spaghetti. Is that a thing? Yeah. Let's do that. Why have we acorn not done getty? that? Why have we Is not that done that? Called? No, we're calling it acorn spaghetti. I don't like that. We gotta call it something. Spaghetti. <laughs> Made from acorns. Rig acorn. Stop. Rig, like rigatoni, but don't hurt, acorns. Don't hurt yourself. <laughs> okay. So anyways, uh, while Elliot is going to learn about leaching tannins, it's also worth knowing that select cultivars exist. So there are cultivars that exist that have very low tannins and also very large nuts. Not touching it. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, well. So... You looked at me like you wanted me to say something. I'm not going to say anything. I did. You can enjoy those large nuts. Have at them. I will. So one of the great things about acorns, or oaks in particular, is that they are one of the most diverse tree species in North America, while also being one of the largest. Plus, animals like pigs are really great at converting acorns into something really delicious. So there's a win-win. Piggy banks. Piggy banks. Tasty little piggy banks. So beech nuts have a similar reputation where pigs are a big fan and people don't generally eat them. But I do think there's 
a lot of opportunity in the future with beech nuts in terms of selective breeding because not a lot of work has been done on it and I think there's a lot of opportunity. So I'm really interested. I I genuinely believe that acorns were something that indigenous people had been selectively breeding and they just weren't done yet, much like honey and locusts were and sweet chestnuts. They I they might have continued continuously had been working on breeding sweet chestnuts or American chestnuts, but they had gotten to a point where they were very easily edible and harvestable. And there's a reason why one out of every four trees before chestnut blight hit was a American chestnut. Because they were tasty. Because they were tasty and you know gave you a shit ton of food. So moving on from nut trees, the Prunus group is a broadly diverse genus of woody plants that includes things like cherries, plums, and peaches. If your property, again, is similar to here, where black cherries are common, there's a high likelihood that other cherries, plums, and peaches will do pretty good on the site, given the right amount of light access. And that's the key thing with cherries and the Prunus family in general, is making sure they get access to light. They don't need from morning to evening sunlight, but just about seven or eight hours or so should be sufficient to get a decent production. Um, so that's definitely something to consider about. I love plums. I haven't had a good plum in a long time. Uh, but for some reason, you naming all these fruits made me realize that I don't eat enough. I don't get enough fiber or quality fruit in my diet. Um, so this is a reminder to everybody out there. Eat your fruit and veggies, everyone. Don't be like me. I am not a role model. Be regular. Eat your fruit. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> just eat good plums. Plums are so good. Unless you're like allergic to them or something. But like... No, if you're allergic, you need to eat more plums. That, what? Why would you do that? Well, <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. Why not? I don't Some, know. I've, sometimes I just like to say things I've, and see what happens. I've seen so many of my lactose intolerant friends get ice cream, and they just look at me, and I'm just like, I, I'm not doing it. You're, you're doing it. So It's your I, life. I guess that's the same it's thing, like right? that Bon Jovi song, It's My Life. I don't know it. We were in like high school when that came out. Come on. Dude. Not Not familiar. Anyways... While some variety of oak biome is the largest across the United States, the second largest naturally forming functional biome is structured around riparian zones. That is, those zones where occasional flooding takes place, usually near riverbanks and things like that. We had said before that savannas are the highest producing sites for energy absorption on land, but underwater is even more incredibly productive, and these cycling processes have allowed the landscapes, especially in the riparian zones, to get the benefits of both. So these regions, unlike, say, a water-saturated floodplain, are considered to be moist but fairly well-drained, so the moisture doesn't sit around for long periods of time. So species that are adapted to this can tolerate being submerged for short lengths of time, and they might not go months while being underwater, but they can survive much more than most species. And generally speaking, this is that Juglandaceae family. So the native species that usually make up this biome are really dependent on temperature. So you've got your pecans and black walnuts as your primary species. And again, beneath it is the, the prunus, which is cherries, plums, and peaches. We also see a lot of shorter, bushier trees like pawpaws, nanny berries, and mayhaws, followed by shade-tolerant fruit-bearing shrubs like raspberries and blackberries, and even things like grapes and passion fruits. Pecans are usually the warmer species that you'll see, while black walnuts generally are cold-hardy, particularly on the East Coast, and butternuts, which are further north, closer to Canada and New England. So for most of these species, even if folks don't have personal experience eating them, they're at least familiar with them as a food, unlike acorns and beech nuts, which people would not believe you that you could eat unless they happen to read something about it. Chances are they've never seen somebody eat it unless they are into foraging or whatever it might be. Or they saw somebody eat it without removing the tannins first. Yeah, and then they won't forget. So one of the things I think that's really important as we continue to talk about the, like trying to figure out what this food forest silvopasture pasture system should look like is to think about what we think of when we start talking about creating these food systems. So when we're talking about growing acorns, or beech nuts, or black walnuts, or whatever it might be, thinking about how we can utilize it in a meaningful way, not as a novelty of our food system. So the goal isn't to say, oh, I'm making pasta or whatever, 
and I'm going to use a black walnut acorn oil. Acorn Getty. Yeah. It's, that sounds like a Yeti that's like into acorns. You came up with it. I know. You got to work on it, bud. I get it. You see, know, I, you can't put me on the spot like See, that. I was just trying to use it in real time. It sounds terrible, doesn't it? I'm terrible. Fix your shit. I'm going to fix my shit. Do better. The point is that when we start talking about these things, we really need to think about how do we fundamentally make them a part of our food systems and not just this thing that we do once and has no meaningful effect on what our food production has to look like. And that's a whole other conversation. But this is a part of that, is thinking about what that means, really. Yeah, if anybody knows how to make acorn pancakes with flour or w- what to use acorn meal for, I'm all for it because there's so many acorns everywhere. And if I could just use that and feed it to people and they'd be like, mm, this is good. And I'd be like, yeah, it's from outside. And watch them spit it out. No, I'll make them eat it. <laughs> It'd be like a scene out of a bad song movie. They're wired to the chair and stuff. Whatever. Yeah. So anyways, these... These food systems are not meant so Elliot can electrocute you, but to think about how we can transition our food systems away from foods that are terrible for the environment. Do you want to play a game? Not with you. You will have to eat <laughs> all of these acorn pancakes. Uh, See so what yeah, I got to put up with? I mean, that that just sounds fun. I might, I might do that. That might be our first Twitch video. Is me force feeding you acorn pancakes. Do you think I haven't eaten acorns? <laughs> Come on. No, you're going to eat my, my acorns. Raw. Raw. Raw with tannins. <laughs> Those large nuts. Nope. Just regular just regular size, average size, little acorn nuts. Cool. So with that said, we can talk about tiny nuts that come from pine trees. So let's talk about those piney, those piney nuts. Like tiny tree nuts. Come on. Keep up. Didn't no laughs. That was good. I apparently like my nuts big. (laughs) Not your jokes. My jokes are tiny nuts. Yeah, so I tried looking some of this stuff up on Google to get on your level, and I still get mad that it doesn't work like that. And I just, I I don't know where you find all of your research papers and stuff. He hasn't shown me his tricks yet, people. I'm I'm trying to get there, though. Let's see. How am I going to phrase this? When you look up different species, they all seem to have slightly different or specific needs to what pH they need, what water, uh, how much water, soil type, um, what species live near them, all these things. How do you remember all of this stuff? Are are you saying like, bit, well, hold on. I think I know the answer. I think you've already answered it. So let me, let me try to keep up here. With the larger organisms that live within that biome, the long live trees and stuff like that, the major contributors to the environment, they sort of leave behind what the next generation is going to need and so on. And so these different biomes, the topsoil sort of gets seasoned with the nutrients that those large producers and impactors of the environment need by leaving behind. So like generally speaking, trees like to live in low pH soils. So if you look at things like needles and tree, uh, the leaves of trees, they're generally a little bit acidic pine needles are acidic yes yeah so they're just a little bit of not as acidic as people think but they have slight acidity and between that and then if we think about the soil episode we had done like a year and a half ago we had talked about the fungi to bacteria relationships and ratios and those forests generally had higher amounts of fungi to bacteria and it wasn't that the bacteria was shrinking but it was that the fungi had grown in amount so between the the materials that the trees are pulling up from underground and the way it's dropping those minerals, plus the fungi and all those other things, they're creating those unique conditions for those specific trees. The trees that take over in succession forest generally have similar, if not the same requirements, obviously not literally one to one, but similar enough that they can thrive in the understory until they're big enough to take over. So at those points, that's when the sort of dominant main player is sort of swapping places or can swap places in in times like that? Yeah, in the forced succession process, that's what it looks like. Okay. But one of the interesting things that you'll find is that if you look at a forest, you'll find that the relationships between the trees and the fungi are much more important than the mineral content of the soil itself. 
you can look at things like wild apples in places like Maine, where if you go online, you'll find that apples really demand calcium rich and alkaline soil, while Maine is pretty much entirely granite and calcium impoverished. Yet they still do extremely well because of the fact that they have those relationships with the fungi in the soil and the other trees in their biome. Ultimately, what we're essentially trying to do is look at how we can plug in species into these already existing systems where they can feed the landscapes ourselves while not demanding the ecology to do anything but what it's already trying to do, which is go through that natural progression and maintain those already existing local biologies. While we are looking to nature for guidance, we are also using some of the tools at our disposal, plants that we've selectively bred for thousands of years in some cases that will not only thrive in the right conditions because of a biome, but also produce more edible crops for us. Most research today suggests this is exactly what indigenous folks had done for thousands of years on the North American continent, and explains why the most edible crops on the continent, like I said, was the American chestnut. So what we are trying to do is target specific plants that can both fill an ecological niche within its ecological community and provide edible crops for both ourselves and our sheep, goats, chickens, cows, or whatever it is you're thinking of getting. Our goddamn piggy banks. Goddamn piggy banks. What we don't or can't eat because of quality issues or simply because nobody can eat 2,000 pounds of apples can be utilized by those grazers. So while these examples of filling ecological niches within the layers of the forest are pretty easy to see, what becomes less easy to see are the seasonal ecological niches. The plants that spring up first in the year and dissipate as the leaves of the trees fill in and block the sun, the fall goldenrod that provides the last bit of pollen for the bees and takes advantages of the last bit of sunlight for the year. Seeing this whole progression takes time. And this is part of why, way back when we started this podcast, I felt it was really necessary to start with talking about this big picture idea, the efficiency of complex systems, and the needs to listen to the ecology first, and not just start digging up your site and cutting down what's there, even if you know you don't want it. This stuff is complex, and we've only been scratching the surface of these various subject areas in the context of ecology and agriculture. This is why my advice to first-time gardeners the folks that are really excited to start applying these principles from ideas like permaculture is to wait and watch the property they're working on. You're hilarious because first time gardeners want to plant something and keep it alive and then take pictures of it when it doesn't die. So you tell them to wait. I don't think they're going to listen. I can pretty much guarantee they're not going to listen. Goddamn Instagram culture. I got to get these pics or it didn't happen, bro. Pics or it didn't happen. I had mentioned in a previous episode that my garden location was dictated by both the soil quality, sun access, and the current topography of the property. But additionally, we had moved in early spring, and I had seen a spot where fiddleheads had popped up right where my garden went. And I had planted my bed around the fiddleheads, giving me another crop to harvest every spring as I plant my annuals. One of the things that most of the people that go out foraging don't tell you, like, yeah, don't harvest all of the plant, only take a third. But the reason is because fiddleheads take like a decade to get to the point where they're harvestable. So that's part of why you don't see a whole lot of foraging content from us is because we don't necessarily need more people foraging. We need more people planting stuff. That's another subject that we'll cover sometime in the future. But to circle back to what I was saying, by watching the site throughout the year, we can see where we can plant things where we want to move stuff around. And if you just go in and tear stuff down, you'll miss these small details that will make your site much more productive. So at this point, I want to get to that third piece of this ecological niche, which we've covered very briefly at this point, which is the role of animals within the ecology. One reason why fewer people have experiences with animal polycultures, that is multiple animals, is that they almost constantly change in both place and in time based on a number of factors. Even in the most inner city location in the world, there already is a polyculture of animals living there. That is because animals left to themselves will move to the place where they find the most or highest quality of whatever it is that they eat at the time. If their food is not where they are, they'll move. 
Much like the systems we've talked about, especially in the first episode of Complex Systems Theory, efficient systems create layers where there isn't much in terms of competition, but niches filled and efficiencies gained by specializing species. But I think it's right around there that we're going to wrap up the first episode on silvopasture. We've covered the basics of the forestry component of it and dipped our toes into the seasonality of the floor of the forest. But in the next episode, we're going to start talking about the animals that inhabit these sites and how that plays into the forest floor, particularly around site brittleness and how that is a key factor in guiding what we can and cannot do. So we've turned the exciting topic of silvopasture into a two-part episode. And I'm going to be honest, if that doesn't get us new listeners, I don't know what will. It's riveting stuff. It really is. Thanks. Uh, This has inspired me to grow and smoke more of my own trees. And I think deer, I think deer like to eat cannabis, actually. And I'm going to start hunting, too. So I can't bait them. But if they come on my property and they're eating my fucking weed, they're going to be on my fucking table, son. (laughs) Like Bambi, maybe it was like a shotgun Bam B. Bam Bye. Ooh, nah, man. That's good. I want Bambi's dad, not his mom. <laughs> I want Bambi herself. Nah, it's weak. Okay. Was Bambi a girl? Yeah, I would assume so. I actually don't know. Was I, Bambi male or female? I don't know. Or was it just, you know, doesn't matter, does it? Doesn't matter. This is Andy with the Poor Pros Almanac. And I'm Elliot, I guess. I'll see you guys on the next episode of Silvo Pasture Part 2, where we get to talk about piggy banks. Part 2. And... We really are gonna wrap bacon the up. We're, we're gonna we're gonna wrap bacon up into this, aren't we? Piggy bank part two. There better be some bacon jokes in this. International. Moment. I gotta but, come up with something good. See, you, you gotta work on I'm it. I'm off today. Yeah, it's it's been rough, man. I don't even know what year it is. Piggy bank part two. The reporking. I don't know, man. Don't love it. Pork and acorns, actually. Pork and like, acorns. I'm hold on. I'm I'm putting together my menu because I just got hungry. So we're gonna do. Acorn spaghetti with like a pork, like fallen maize, like you know what I mean? Pork acorn and maize. Th- that sounds pretty good. We might have to try to make that, but until next time, this is Elliot, Proposal Almanac. Listen to us, give us likes, reviews, and stuff. Love you, bye.